Good morning, home worshipers, and welcome to this November 14th service. <clears throat> if you haven't heard yet, for this Sunday's in-church worship, we're back in our newly renovated sanctuary. Thanks be to God. Let us open our hearts and minds to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and give our praise to our Creator, for God is good. All, all the time. And all the time. God, God is good. Let us pray. Father God, we offer our thanks, as always, for your presence with us this day as we worship you and your Holy Son. It is by your love that made us and your love that has kept us, and we'll humbly ask that you forgive us for what we've been, help us to amend what we are, and guide us, Father God, to what you have called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> Today's scripture comes from the New Testament book, of Mark chapter 10 verses 17 through 27. I ask that you listen as I read from Mark's gospel. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, hmm, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked. And went away grieving for he had many possessions then jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of god and the disciples were perplexed at these words but jesus said to them again children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of god it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of god they were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for, not for God. For God all things are possible. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. Well, the title of this sermon is, If I Were a Rich Man. Some of you might think that is probably going to be a sermon about Fiddler on the Roof, Deedle Diddle, Deedle Diddle Dum, but it is not. It is about a rich man, though. Today's scripture comes from Mark's Gospel, and it's a story of a rich, young ruler who came to Jesus asking a very simple question. And that question, as I read, was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is usually interpreted as a text all about money, but I don't think it's just about money. I think it's more a story about salvation and how one gets it. A Methodist pastor had learned that a number of his congregants had received driving citations, primarily for speeding. Concerned for their safety, he expressed an interesting take on salvation one Sunday morning. He said that he thought the way we act behind the wheel of our car is oftentimes more indicative of our walk with God than just coming to church every week. So he compiled four hymns, four hymns for his congregation relative to how fast they should drive their car. He said, at 60 miles an hour, the hymn is, God will take care of you. He said, if you're driving 75 miles an hour, the hymn is, nearer my God to thee. If you decide to drive 80 miles an hour, the hymn is going to be, Lord, I'm coming home. And if you're driving 90 miles an hour, the hymn is going to be, precious memories. <laughs> Again, I say I think this scripture story is more about salvation than it is about money. Money is nothing more than an instrument. It's a means to an end. You can do all kinds of things with money, can't you? It's been said that money is the root, I repeat, the root of all evil. That comes from the Bible, 1 Timothy, correct? Not so fast, my friend. St. Paul in 1 Timothy tells us it's the love of money. That's the root of all evil. This reminds me of a story. A 
a young man who uh, decided he would finally propose to the girl of his dreams. Darling, he said, I want you to know that I love you more than anything in this entire world, and I want you to please marry me. I'm not rich like Jerry Green. I don't own a yacht or a Rolls Royce like him, but I do love you with all of my heart. She thought for a moment, and then she said to him, I love you too, sweetheart, with all of my heart, but can you tell me a little bit more about Jerry Green? Well, the love of money, that is the root of all evil. In other words, the desire to accumulate money in itself is truly the source of evil. Money can be used to do lots of good, no doubt about that, which is why Christians have an ethic, an ethic which we, with regards to money. It is called stewardship. Stewardship is based on the assumption that money is given to us as an instrument for doing good in this world. But more often, even among Christians, it is not used as an instrument for doing good, but it is used as a means of measuring someone's success, which is how it was used by the rich, young ruler who came to question Jesus. Perhaps some of you have heard of a man named Lamar Hunt. He was the founder of the original AFL, the American Football League, the NASA, the North American Soccer League, and an owner of the New York excuse me, the Kansas City Chiefs in the NFL. He died in 2006 at the age of 74. During the late 70s and into the 80s, he and his two brothers, Nelson and William, attempted to corner the silver market. With a few million dollars, they began buying silver. Silver, silver, the more they could get, the better. And this went on for about eight to 10 years. By 1979, they owned one third, can you believe it? one third of the world's silver, and they simply sat on it. This caused the price to rise from $11 an ounce to $50 an ounce. Still sitting on their silver, the brothers' net worth went from a few million to over $4 billion. But on March 27, 1980, called Silver Thursday, the price collapsed. In September 1988, eight years later, the Hunt brothers had to file for bankruptcy. Lamar Hunt said of his father, our father said he didn't really care about money that much. It was just a way of measuring how successful someone is. It was his way of keeping score. Well, that's not the way money was used in Jesus' time, folks. The dominant theology in those days was the idea that if you were good, if you were good, that God would bless you with more money. You would become a rich man. If you were not good, then God would curse you and throw you into poverty, and all manner of evils would come to you. This was called the Deuteronomic Code, coming from the book of Deuteronomy. The code was made, the code made it clear that God would arrange our moral values based upon what we did in our life. If you follow God's laws, you would prosper. If you didn't follow those laws, you would not prosper. There is some truth to that, meaning that there are consequences to our actions. You can see it especially over the long haul, folks, but not always immediately. You can see it clearly if you read history, what has happened to people, but not so clearly if you just read the daily newspaper. There are, however, times when it often appears otherwise. By that I mean there seems there are no consequences to some people's actions. There are people in this world who prosper who get all the breaks in life, and they are far from being exemplary, or might I say, Christian. And there are others who are beautiful people, almost saintly, if you will, very Christian people, who have all kinds of calamity in their lives. It just doesn't seem right. So Deuteronomy has to be a little bit qualified, I think. But in Jesus' day, they did not qualify it. They took Deuteronomy as the actual law. They believed that wealth was a sure sign of God's blessing on your life. Back to our story. A rich man comes to Jesus. Everyone in the first century in Palestine would recognize who this man was immediately just by seeing him. He was the prototype of a good man. He can prove it because he had wealth. The credential telling everyone that he was living the kind of life God wanted him to live. And as a result, God had blessed him. In Mark's gospel, this man is referred to as just that, a man. 
In Matthew's gospel, he is called a good man. And in Luke's gospel, he is called a ruler. So the composite picture of him, which is probably accurate, is that he was rich, he was young, and he in fact was a ruler. And by ruler, I'm telling you, he was a landowner. That's what a ruler was then. In today's terms, this young man would be extremely successful, extraordinarily, extraordinarily rich. We might say that he must be doing something right. But in the first century, back then, people would have had a similar reaction, but would also say this man must be also righteous, which is the title given to successful people in those days, meaning that they were right with God. In reading and rereading this story, I found three things, three things to be extraordinary. Let me share those with you. The first thing is this man knelt, as it said in Scripture, at the feet of Jesus. I say this is extraordinary because it was rare, very rare, for a Jew to kneel in front of another man. It just didn't happen. From his kneeling position, he asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus rebuked him for calling him good, saying no one is good but God. So from the outset, we find a contradiction in that the world can be divided between good and bad people. And the way we tell them apart is to look at their circumstances. Good people prosper. They have good health and they live well. Bad people, bad people do not prosper, oftentimes suffer and are very, very poor. But Jesus negates that when he says, no one is good but God. Folks, we're sinners. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. That being said, maybe our comfortable, somewhat affluent lives aren't the product of our goodness, folks, but are a product of God's grace. Then the man asked another question, which is the second extraordinary thing I want to share with you. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus probably thought that this man would be the last person he, he would expect to ask that, that question. I say that because first century Jews knew the answer to that question. All of them knew the answer. The Jewish belief structure told everyone that if you obey the law, do all the right things, you will have eternal life. Jesus says to him, you know the commandments. Jesus then recites five of the ten. Those commandments that have to do with our relationship with other people. You shall not murder, commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, and you shall, you shall honor your mother and your father. But then, the third extraordinary thing appears, at least to me. In these Ten Commandments, Jesus adds an eleventh. Thou shalt not defraud, which comes from the book of Leviticus. Interesting, don't you think? An eleventh commandment. Why did Jesus edit those common Ten Commandments. Well, I think it's because he's talking to a rich man. And in their society, wealth was gained by owning land and leasing it to people who we would call tenant farmers today. He would then exploit them. He would charge them high rent, and he would also take a portion of the money they received for the harvested crops they produced. Jesus, who grew up in rural Galilee among poor farmers, knew this all too well. So that's why I think he added this 11th commandment. Thou shalt not defraud. I might add that if anybody would be allowed or should be allowed to add another commandment, Jesus probably would be the one we would let do that. After Jesus had read the commandments, the man tells him, I have kept all of these since my youth. Then Mark tells us Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus loved him. This is one of the very few places in the Gospels where it, is, it says Jesus loved someone. Why here? Why would he love this rich man? Well, I think it's because Jesus perceived this man's sincerity, his innocence, and his honesty to come to him with the confession that his life, though loaded down with things, was empty. Just as I suspect Jesus loves all of us who come to him to admit that the life we are trying to live is oftentimes empty without him. This rich ruler is a bit like Nicodemus in John's Gospel. Nicodemus, another rich man, another ruler, a landowner, sought out Jesus under the cover of darkness to ask that same question about eternal life. 
It was Nicodemus that Jesus answered, telling him, you must be born again. So Jesus looked at this young man and loved him. Then Jesus said, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. The scene ends with the rich man sadly walking away because he had all these possessions and did not want to relinquish any of those, which I think is a testimony to how powerful possessions are in many people's lives today. Jesus then gives the disciples a little homily on wealth, how hard it would be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is the exact opposite of what everybody in that society taught, was taught and taught to believe. So you see how subversive this passage is to often to too many people. Jesus was thought, in fact, to be undermining the basic morality of that society at that time. That is why they, the Pharisees, were against him. That is why they arrested him. The reaction of the disciples is what you would expect. They were perplexed and they asked, then who can be saved? That's the right question to ask, I think. The obvious question in a society that believed wealth was a sign of goodness and that God rewarded goodness with eternal life. In that kind of world, if a rich man can't be saved, then who can be saved? which sets up Jesus for his punchline. For mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible, which means we are saved by God's grace alone. We become the great affirmation. It became the great affirmation in Paul's letters, the basis for the Reformation, and the foundation of our Protestant faith today. We can do all the good works in the world and still not find our salvation, because salvation is a gift given to us through a man called Jesus. Salvation lies not in what we can do for God, but in what God has already done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. To repeat, good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life was the rich young ruler's question. Jesus' response was for him to obey the commandments, including the 11th, to sell all that he had, and then to come and follow him. This, folks, is a path to heaven, and why I think that salvation, not money, is the point of this story in Mark's Gospel. Amen.